Oh, guten Tag. And welcome back to Baby Alice's stories. We now return to A Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter 35 An Electric Storm Friday, August 21st On the morrow, the magnificent geyser has disappeared. The wind has risen and has rapidly carried us away from Axel Island. The roarings become lost in the distance. The weather, if we may use that term, will change before long. The atmosphere is charged with vapors, pervaded with the electricity generated by the evaporation of saline waters. The clouds are sinking lower and assume an olive hue. The electric light can scarcely penetrate through the tense curtain which has dropped over the theatre on which the battle of the elements is about to be waged. I feel peculiar sensations like many creatures on earth at the approach of violent atmospheric changes, the heavily voluted cumulus clouds lower gloomily and threateningly. They wear that implacable look which I have sometimes noticed at the outbreak of a great storm. The air is heavy. The sea is calm. In the distance, the clouds resemble great bales of cotton piled up in picturesque disorder. By degrees they dilate and gain in huge size what they lose in number. Such is their ponderous weight that they cannot rise from the horizon, but, obeying an impulse from higher currents, their dense consistency slowly yields. The gloom upon them deepens, and they soon present to our view a ponderous mass of almost level surface. From time to time a fleecy tuft of mist, with yet some gleamy light left upon it, drops down upon the dense floor of grey, and loses itself in the opaque and impenetrable mass. The atmosphere is evidently charged and surcharged with electricity. My whole body is saturated. My hair bristles just as when you stand upon an insulated stool under the action of an electrical machine. It seems to me as if my companions, the moment they touched me, would receive a severe shock like that from an electric eel. At ten in the morning the symptoms of storm become aggravated. The wind never lulls, but to acquire increased strength. The vast bank of heavy clouds is a huge reservoir of fearful windy gusts and rushing storms. I am loath to believe these atmospheric menaces, and yet I cannot help muttering. Here's some very bad weather coming on. The professor made no answer. His temper is awful to judge from the working of his features as he sees this vast length of ocean unrolling before him to an indefinite extent. He can only spare time to shrug his shoulders viciously. There's a heavy storm coming on, I cried, pointing towards the horizon. Those clouds seem as if they were going to crush the sea. A deep silence falls on all around. The lately roaring winds are hushed into a dead calm. Nature seems to breathe no more and to be sinking into the stillness of death. On the mast 
Already I see the light play of a lambent St. Elmo's fire. The outstretched sail catches not a breath of wind and hangs like a sheet of lead. The rudder stands motionless in a sluggish, waveless sea. What? If we have now ceased to advance, why do we yet leave that sail loose, which at the first shock of the tempest may capsize us in a moment? Let us reef the sail and cut the mast down, I cried. That will be safest. No, no, never, shouted my impetuous uncle. Never. Let the wind catch us if it will. What I want is to get the least glimpse of rock or shore, even if our raft should be smashed into shivers. The words were hardly out of his mouth when a sudden change took place in the southern sky. The pile of vapors condensed into water and the air put into violent action to supply the vacuum left by the condensation of the mist. Rouses itself into a whirlwind. It rushes on from the farthest recesses of the vast cavern. The darkness deepens. Scarcely can I jot down a few hurried notes. The hell makes a bound. My uncle falls full length. I creep close to him. He has laid a firm hold upon a rope and appears to watch this grim satisfaction, this awful display of elemental strife. Hans stirs not his long hair blown by the pelting storm and laid flat across his immovable countenance, makes him a strange figure, for the end of each lock of those of loose flowing hair is tipped with little luminous radiations. This frightful mask of electric sparks suggests to me, even in this dizzy excitement, a comparison with preadamate man. The contemporary of the Ichthyosaurus and the Megatherium. Side note, rather of the Mammoth and the Mastodon. End side note. The mast yet holds firm. The sail stretches tight like a bubble ready to burst. The raft flies at a rate that I cannot reckon but not so fast as the foaming clouds of spray which it dashes from side to side in its headlong speed. The sail! The sail! I cry, motioning to lower it. No! replies my uncle. Neige! repeats Hans, leisurely shaking his head. But now... The rain forms a rushing cataract in front of that horizon, toward which we are running with such maddening speed. But before it has reached us, the rain cloud parts asunder. The sea boils and the electric fires are brought into violent action by a mighty chemical power that descends from the higher regions. The most vivid flashes of lightning are mingled with the violent crash of continuous thunder. Ceaseless, fiery arrows dart in and out amongst the flying thunder clouds. The vapor's mass soon glows with incandescent heat. Hailstones rattle fiercely down, and as they dash upon our iron tools, they too emit gleams and flashes of lurid light. The heaving waves resemble fiery volcanic hills each belching forth its own interior flames, and every crest is plumed with dancing fire. My eyes fail under the dazzling light. My ears are stunned with the incessant crash of thunder. I must be bound to the mast, which bows like a reed before the mighty strength of the storm. Here my notes become vague and indistinct, I have only been able to find a few which I seem to have jotted down almost unconsciously, but their very brevity and their obscurity reveal the intensity of the excitement which dominated me and describes the actual position even better than my memory could do. 
Sunday, 23rd. Where are we? Driven forward with a swiftness that cannot be measured. The night was fearful, no abatement of the storm. The din and uproar are incessant. Our ears are bleeding. To exchange a word is impossible. The lightning flashes with intense brilliancy and never seems to cease for a moment. Zigzag streams of bluish white fire dash down upon the sea and rebound, and then take an upward flight till they strike the granite vault that overarches our heads. Suppose that solid roof should crumble down upon our heads. Other flashes this incessant play cross their vivid fires, while others again roll themselves into balls of living fire which explode like bombshells, but the music of which scarcely adds to the din of the battle. To the din, to the din of the battle strife that almost deprives us of our senses of hearing and sight. The limit of intense loudness has been passed within which the human ear can distinguish one sound from another. If all the powder magazines in the world were to explode at once, we should hear no more than we do now. From the undersurface of the clouds there are continual emissions of lurid light, electrical matter in this continual evolution from their component molecules. The gaseous elements of the air need to be slaked with moisture for innumerable columns of water rush upwards into the air and fall back again in white foam. Whither are we flying? My uncle lies full length across the raft. The heat increases. I refer to the thermometer. It indicates the figure is obliterated. Monday, August 24. Will there be an end to it? Is the atmospheric condition, having once reached this density, to become final? We are prostrated and worn out with fatigue. What haunts is as usual. The raft bears on still to the southeast. We have made 200 leagues since we left Axel Island. At noon, the violence of the storm redoubles. We are obliged to secure as fast as possible every article that belongs to our cargo. Each of us is lashed to some part of the raft. The waves rise above our heads. For three days, we have never been able to make each other hear a word. Our mouths open, our lips move, but not a word can be heard. We cannot even make ourselves heard by approaching our mouths close to the ear. My uncle has drawn nearer to me. He has uttered a few words. They seem to be, we are lost, but I am not sure. At last, I write down the words, let us lower the sail. He nods his consent. Scarcely has he lifted his head again before a ball of fire has bounded over the waves and lighted on board our raft. Mast and sail flew up in an instant together, and I saw them carried up to prodigious height, resembling in appearance a petrodactyl, a pterodactyl, one of those strong birds of the infant world. We lay there, our blood running cold with unspeakable terror, the fireball, half of it white, half Asia blue, and the size of a ten-inch shell moved slowly about the raft, but revolving on its own axis with astonishing velocity, as if whipped round by the force of the whirlwind. Here it comes, there it glides, now it is up the ragged stump of the mast, since it lightly leaps on the provision bag, descends with a light bound, and just skims the powder magazine. How horrible! We shall be blown up, but no. The dazzling disk of mysterious light nimbly leaps aside. It approaches Hans, who fixes his blue eyes upon it steadily. It threatens the head of my uncle, who falls upon his knees, who falls upon his knees with his head down to avoid it. And now my turn comes. 
pale and trembling under the blinding splendor and the melting heat. It drops at my feet, spinning silently round upon the deck. I try to move my feet, I try to move my foot away, but cannot. A suffocating smell of nitrogen fills the air. It enters the throat, it fills the lungs. We suffer stifling pains. Why am I unable to move my foot? Is it riveted to the planks? Alas, the fall upon our fatted raft of this electric globe has magnetized every iron article on board. The instruments, the tools, our guns are clashing and clanking violently in their collisions with each other. The nails of my boots cling tenaciously to a plate of iron let into the timbers. And I cannot draw my foot away from the spot. At last, by a violent effort, I release myself at the instant when the ball in its great gyrations was about to seize upon it and carry me off my feet. Ah, what a flood of intense and dazzling light. The globe has burst and we are deluged with tongues of fire. Then all the light disappears. I could just see my uncle at full length on the raft and Hans still at his helm and spitting fire under the action of the electricity which has saturated him. But where are we going to? Where? Tuesday, August 25. I recover from a long swoon. The storm continues to roar and rage. The lightnings dash hither and scissor like broods of fiery serpents filling all the air. Are we still under the sea? Yes, we are born at incalculable speed. We have been carried under England, under the Channel, under France, perhaps under the whole of Europe. A fresh noise is heard. Surely it is the sea breaking upon the rocks. But then? Chapter 36 Calm Philosophic Discussions Here I end what I may call my log happily saved from the wreck, and I resume my narrative as before. What happened when the raft was dashed upon the rocks is more than I can tell. I felt myself hurled into the waves, and if I escaped from death, and if my body was not torn over the sharp edges of the rocks, it was because the powerful arm of Hans came to my rescue. The brave Icelander carried me out of the reach of the waves, over a burning sand where I found myself by the side of my uncle. Then he returned to the rocks, against which the furious waves were beating, to say what he could. I was unable to speak. I was shattered with fatigue and excitement. I wanted a whole hour to recover, even a little. But a deluge of rain was still falling. Through this, that violence which generally denotes the near cessation of a storm. A few overhanging rocks afforded us some shelter from the storm. Hans prepared some food which I could not touch, and each of us, exhausted this three sleepless nights, fell into a broken and painful sleep. The next day the weather was splendid. The sky and the sea had sunk into sudden repose. Every trace of the awful storm had disappeared. The exhilarating voice of the professor fell upon my ears as I awoke. He was ominously cheerful. 
Well, my boy, he cried, have you slept well? Would not anyone have thought that we were still in our cheerful little house, on the Konigstrasse, and that I was only just coming down to breakfast, and that I was to be married to Groben that day? Alas, if the tempest had but sent the raft a little more east, we should have passed under Germany, under my beloved town of Hamburg, under the very street where dwelt all that I loved most in the world. Then only forty leagues would have separated us. But they were forty leagues perpendicular of solid granite wall, and in reality we were a thousand leagues asunder. All these painful reflections rapidly crossed my mind before I could answer my uncle's question. Well now, he repeated, won't you tell me how you have slept? Oh, very well, I said. I am only a little knocked up, but I shall soon be better. Oh, says my uncle, that's nothing to signify. You are only a little bit tired. But you, uncle, you seem in very good spirits this morning. Delighted, my boy, delighted. We have got there to our journey's end. No, but we have got to the end of that endless sea. Now we shall go by land and really begin to go down down, down. But, my dear uncle, do let me ask you one question. Of course, Axel. How about returning? Returning? Why, you are talking about the return before the arrival. No, I only want to know that. No. I only want to know how that is to be managed. In the simplest way possible. When we have reached the center of the globe, either we shall find some new way to get back, or we shall come back like decent folks the way we came. I feel pleased at this thought, that it is sure not to be shut against us. But then we shall have to refit the raft. Of course. Then as to provisions, have we enough to last? Yes, to be sure we have. Hans is a clever fellow, and I am sure he must have saved a large part of our cargo. But still, let us go and make sure. We left this grotto, which lay open to every wind. At the same time I cherished a trembling hope, which was a fear as well. It seemed to me impossible that the terrible wreck of the raft should not have destroyed everything on board. On my arrival on the shore I found Hans surrounded by an assemblage of articles, all arranged in good order. My uncle shook hands with him with a lively gratitude. This man, this almost superhuman devotion, had been at work all the while that we were asleep, and had saved the most precious of the articles at the risk of his life. Not that we had suffered no losses, for instance, our firearms, but we might do without them. Our stock of powder had remained uninjured after having risked blowing up during the storm. Well, cried the professor, as we have no guns, we cannot hunt, that's all. Yes, but how about the instruments? Here is the aneroid, the most useful of all and for which I would have given all the others. By means of it, I can calculate the depths and know when we have reached the center. Without it, we might very likely go beyond. 
and come out at the antipodes. Such high spirits as these were rather too strong. Such high spirits as these were rather too strong. But where is the compass? I asked. Here it is, upon this rock, in perfect condition, as well as the thermometers and the chronometer. And the chronometer. The hunter is a splendid fellow. There was no denying it. We had all our instruments as for tools and appliances. There they all lay on the ground, ladders, ropes, picks, spades, etc. Still, there was a question of provisions to be settled, and I asked, How are we off for provisions? The boxes containing these were in a line upon the shore, in a perfect state of preservation. For the most part, the sea had spared them, and what with biscuits, salt meat, spirits, and salt fish, we might reckon on four months' supply. Four months, cried the professor. We have time to go and to return, and with what is left, I will give a grand dinner to my friends at the Johannium. I ought by this time to have been quite accustomed to my uncle's ways, yet there was always something fresh about him to astonish me. Now, said he, we will replenish our supply of water with the rain which the storm has left in all these granite basins. Therefore, we shall have no reason to fear anything from thirst. As for the raft, I will recommend Hans to do his best to repair it, although I don't expect it will be of any further use to us. How so? I cried. An idea of my own, my lad. I don't think we shall come out by the ways that we went in. I stared at the professor with a good deal of mistrust. I asked. Was he not touched in the brain? And yet there was method in his madness. And now let us go to breakfast, said he. I followed him to a headland after he had given his instructions to the hunter. Their preserved meat, biscuit and tea made us an excellent meal. One of the best I ever remember. Hunger, the fresh air the calm, quiet weather. After the commotions we had gone through, all contributed to give me a good appetite. Whilst breakfasting, I took the opportunity to put to my uncle the question, where we were now. That seems to me, I said, rather difficult to make out. Yes, it is difficult he said, to calculate exactly, perhaps even impossible, since during these three stormy days I have been unable to keep any account of the rate or direction of the raft, but still we may get an approximation. The last observation, I remarked, was made on the island when the geyser was you mean Axel Island? Don't decline the honor of having given your name to the first island ever discovered in the central parts of the globe. Well, said I, let it be Axel Island. Then we had cleared 270 leagues of sea and we were 600 leagues from Iceland. Very well, answered my uncle. Let us start. From that point and count four days storm, during which our raid cannot have been less than 80 leagues in the 24 hours. That is right, and this would make 300 leagues more. Yes, and the Liedenbrock Sea would be 600 leagues from shore to shore. Surely, Axel, it may vie in size with the Mediterranean itself. Especially. I replied, if it happens that we have only crossed it in its narrowest part, 
And it is a and it is a curious circumstance, I added, that if my computations are right, and we are nine hundred leagues from Reykjavik, we have now the Mediterranean above our head. That is a good long way, my friend. But whether we are under Turkey or the Atlantic depends very much upon the question in what direction we have been moving. Perhaps we have deviated. No, I think not. Our course has been the same all along, and I believe this shore is southeast of Port Groben. Well, replied my uncle. We may easily ascertain this by consulting the compass. Let us go and see what it says. The professor moved towards the rock upon which Hans had laid down the instruments. He was gay and full of spirits. He rubbed his hands. He studied his attitudes. I followed him, curious to know if I was right in my estimate. As soon as we had arrived at the rock, my uncle took the compass laid it horizontally, and questioned the needle which, after a few oscillations, presently assumed a fixed position. My uncle looked and looked and looked again. He rubbed his eyes and then turned to me, thunderstruck, with some unexpected discovery. What is the matter? I asked. He motioned me to look. An exclamation of astonishment burst from me. The north pole of the needle was turned to what we supposed to be the south. It pointed to the shore instead of to the open sea. I shook the box, examined it again. It was in perfect condition. In whatever position I placed the box, the needle pertinaciously returned to this unexpected quarter. Therefore, there seemed no reason to doubt that during the storm there had been a sudden change of wind unperceived by us, which had brought our raft back to the shore which we thought we had left so long a distance behind us. Chapter 37 The Liedenbrook Museum of Geology How shall I describe the strange series of passions which in succession shook the breast of Professor Liedenbrook? First, stupefaction. Then, incredulity. Lastly, a downright burst of rage. Never had I seen the man so put out of countenance and so disturbed. The fatigues of our passage across, the dangers met, had all to be begun over again. We had gone backwards instead of forwards. But my uncle rapidly recovered himself. Aha! Fate will... Aha! Will fate play tricks upon me? Will the elements play plots against me? Shall fire, air, and water make a combined attack against me? Well, they shall know what a determined man can do. I will not yield. I will not stir a single foot backwards. And it will be seen whether man or nature is to have the upper hand. Erect upon the rock, angry and threatening, Otto Liedenbrock was a rather grotesque, fierce parody upon the fierce Achilles defying the lightning. But I thought it my duty to interpose and attempt to lay some restraint upon this unmeasured fanaticism. Just listen to me, I said firmly. Ambition must have a limit somewhere. We cannot perform impossibilities. We 
They are not at all fit for another sea voyage. Who would dream of undertaking a voyage of 500 leagues upon a heap of rotten planks with a blanket and rags for a sail, a stick for a mast, and a fierce winds in our teeth? We cannot steer. We shall be buffeted by the tempest. And we should be fools and madmen to attempt to cross a second time. I was able to develop this series of unanswerable reasons for ten minutes without interruption. Not that the professor was paying any respectful attention to his nephew's arguments, but because he was deaf to all my eloquence. To the raft, he shouted. Such was his only reply. It was no use for me to entreat, supplicate, get angry, or do anything else in the way of opposition. It would only have been opposing a will harder than the granite rock. Hans was finishing the repairs of the raft. One would have thought that this strange being was guessing at my uncle's intentions. With a few more pieces of Sir Turbrand, he had refitted our vessel. Sir Turbrand. A sail already hung from the new mast, and the wind was playing in its waving folds. The professor said a few words to the guide, and immediately he put everything on board and arranged every necessary for our departure. The air was clean and the northwest wind blew steadily. What could I do? Could I stand against the two? It was impossible. If Hans had but taken my side, but no, it was not to be. The Icelander seemed to have renounced all will of his own and made a vow to forget and deny himself. I could get nothing out of a servant so feudalized, as it were, to his master. My only course was to proceed. I was therefore going with as much resignation as I could find to resume my accustomed place on the raft when my uncle laid his hand upon my shoulder. We shall not sail until tomorrow, he said. I made a movement intended to express resignation. I must neglect nothing, he said. And since my fate has driven me on this part of the coast, I will not leave it until I have examined it. To understand what followed, I must be borne in mind that, through circumstances hereafter to be explained, we were not really where the professor supposed we were. In fact, we were not upon the north shore of the sea. Now let us start upon fresh discoveries. I said, and leaving Hans to work, we started off together. The space between the water and the foot of the cliffs was considerable. It took half an hour to bring us to the wall of rock. We trampled under our feet numberless shells of all the forms and sizes which existed in the earliest stages of the world. I also saw immense carapaces. Carapaces. Carapace, the hard upper shell of a turtle, crustacean, or arachnid. I also saw immense carapaces more than 15 feet in diameter. They had been the coverings of those gigantic glyptodons or armadillos of the Pliocene period, of which the modern tortoise is but a miniature representative. The soil was besides this scattered. The soil was besides this scattered with stony fragments, boulders, 
rounded by water action, and reached up in successive lines. I was therefore led to the conclusion that at one time the sea must have covered the ground on which we were treading. On the loose and scattered rocks, now out of the reach of the highest of the highest tides, the waves had left manifest traces of their power to wear their way in the hard stone. This might up to a certain point explain the existence of an ocean forty leagues beneath the surface of the globe. But, in my opinion, this liquid mass would be lost by degrees further and further within the interior of the earth, and it certainly had its origin in the waters of the ocean overhead, which had made their way hither through some fissures. Through some fissure. Yet it must be believed that that fissure is now closed, and that all this cavern or immense reservoir was filled in a very short time. Perhaps even this water, subjected to the fierce action of central heat, had partly been resolved into vapor. This would explain the existence of those clouds suspended over our heads and the development of that electricity which raised such tempests within the bowels of the earth. This theory of the phenomena we had witnessed seemed satisfactory to me, for however great and stupendous the phenomena of nature, fixed physical laws will or may always explain them. We were therefore walking upon sedimentary soils, the deposits of the waters of former ages. The professor was carefully examining every little feature in the rocks. Wherever he saw a hole, he always wanted to know the depths of it. To him, this was important. We had traversed the shores of the Liedenbrook Sea for a mile when we observed a sudden change in the appearance of the soil. It seemed upset, contorted, and convulsed by a violent upheaval of the lower strata. In many places, depressions or elevations gave witness to some tremendous power affecting the dislocation of strata. We moved with difficulty across these granite fissures and chasms mingled with silex, crystals of quartz and alluvial deposits. When a field, nay, more than a field, a vast plain of bleached bones lay spread before us. It seemed like an immense cemetery where the remains of twenty ages mingled their dust together. Huge mounds of bony fragments rose stage after stage in the distance. They undulated away to the limits of the horizon and melted in the distance in a faint haze. There, within three square miles, were accumulated the materials for a complete history of the animal life of ages, a history scarcely outlined in the two recent strata of the inhabited world. What an impatient curiosity impelled our steps, crackling and rattling. Our feet were trampling on the remains of prehistoric animals and interesting fossils, the possessions of which is a matter of rivalry and contention between the museum of great cities. A thousand cuviers could never have reconstructed the organic remains deposited in this magnificent and unparalleled collection. I stood amazed. My uncle had uplifted his long arms to the vault which was our sky, his mouth gaping wide, his eyes flashing behind his shining spectacles, his head balancing this an up and down motion. His whole attitude denoted unlimited astonishment. Here he stood facing an immense collection of scattered Leptotheria, Mer Mericoceria, Lofioda, Anoplotheria, Magaceria, Mastodons, Protopisaceae, Pterodactyls, and all sorts of extinct monsters here assembled together for his special 
satisfaction. Fancy, an enthusiastic bibliomaniac suddenly brought into the midst of the famous Alexandrian library, burnt by Omar and restored by a miracle from its ashes. Just such a crazed enthusiast was my uncle, Professor Liedenbrock. But more was to come when, with a rush through clouds of bone dust, he laid his hand upon a bare skull and cried with a voice trembling with excitement, Axel, Axel, a human head! A human skull? I cried, no less astonished. Yes, nephew, aha, Monsieur Mine Edwards. Ah, Monsieur de Quatrefages, how I wish you were standing here at the side of Otto Liedenbrock. <laughs>